grace and peace I give to you. Not my grace, not my peace, but the peace of our gracious, holy, loving Lord. Everlasting peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace that will nourish and sustain and empower you. This is another day to celebrate our good, gracious, and loving God. I am the Reverend Roy Foster Scarborough. I come to you from my office. We have a door here and a door there that will come in a little bit later in our sermon time. But I am the pastor of Big Spring and Clover Hill Presbyterian Churches, and I bring you greetings and welcome. And this is the message for the first weekend in May. I pray that God is with you, that you feel the Lord's presence, that you know that he has you and that he holds you. Let us begin with a prayer. Please bow your head with me. God of grace and glory, Lord of love, our everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the great Comforter and Provider, Father, Son, and Spirit, our Triune God, our risen Lord, we come to you with expectation, with thanksgiving, with rejoicing, God, for you are with us. You have been with us. You have been going before us and coming along behind us, and your presence is with each of us. Thank you, God, for that gift. Thank you for that preparation, for that care. Holy God, mighty God, I thank you that you continue to bind us together even when we are spread apart that you disperse us so that we may be ambassadors for you, good stewards in all places, proclaiming your love, hope, joy, and peace to all people. We proclaim the year of Jubilee, the time of forgiveness. We thank you, God, and we praise you. We thank you that we can continue to grow closer to you. Holy God, mighty God, as we lift our prayers to you, Lord, as we lift up those on our prayer list, as we lift up ourselves, as we lift up the concerns that we have not mentioned, God, we thank you that you know every one. Just as you quilted us together in our mother's wombs, you know us wholly and completely even now. You have numbered the hairs of our head. Lord, we thank you that you have heard our prayers. We pray, Holy God, with thanksgiving that your grace continues, that you know all the words that we form in our minds even before they are on our tongues, even before they come out. And the words you spoke on the cross still ring true, Lord. You said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We rejoice in that grace, O oh Lord, and we confess that we need it each and every day. That we might think we have made good plans. We might think we are choosing the right way. And then we discover our sin and brokenness yet again. Thank you for your forgiveness, O oh Lord. We pray that we will follow you, that we will look for your cords of loving kindness, that we will allow goodness and mercy to catch us and to lead us that we can be that blessing that you've called and made us to be. We join our voices with thanksgiving and pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I pray that you all are all well. Diane and I are about to embark on our journey. And we pray that we'll be gaining wisdom as we go. We pray wisdom for all of those who are watching this message. Special shout out to all the folks gathered at Tammy's house. She said she was going to have a little house church, so I'm praying especially for you all. I'm praying for each one of you individually and as families wherever, wherever you may be gathered, trusting that God binds us together as one. 
for his love, glory, for his joy, and for our peace. Let us have a reading from the word of Psalms. Be reading the 92nd Psalm, the whole of this Psalm. I pray that your hearts and minds are open to hear what Scripture is saying to us in the church. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The dullard cannot know. The stupid cannot understand this. Though the wicked sprout like grass and evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For your enemies, O Lord, for your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they will produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is good to read the Psalms. I pray that you all read Psalms often and regular, that you find them encouraging. It is nice to think that if we are in our Lord, if we are seeking his wisdom, if we are going with what he is guiding us to, that we can be full of sap now and always, that we can produce fruit in season and out of season. I hope that's our desire, that we will be desiring to serve the Lord, to seek his wisdom, to seek his face, and to be fruitful. I know for some of us it gets tiring to think about being fruitful. We're not as young and as full of vigor as we used to be. I know there's also some out there who are expected to be young and full of vigor and the world seems pretty heavy and tiring for you as well. Life can wear us down, but our God brings us hope anew. That is the joy of the resurrection. What we continue to celebrate in Easter is that same resurrection power that brought Christ's dead body back to life can restore each of us. That's what the psalmist is rejoicing about, that we can be restored and renewed, that we can be made whole. For God's resurrection is true just for Christ and just for us. It is true for all those who seek God, who desire to know his ways and to give him honor and glory. With that in mind, let us hear a reading. It is from my favorite proverb, Proverbs 3. We'll be reading the first 12 verses. Pray that your hearts and minds are still open to hear what Scripture is saying to us, the church. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own insight. 
in all your ways acknowledge God, and he will make straight your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bur bursting with wine. Blah, blah, blah. My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves and the one the Lord reproves the one he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know for some it is not fun to think about being called a child. We don't like being designated as children or being described as lacking knowledge. Of course, if you're like me, you're probably too often proving the knowledge you lack and displaying how much you really are a child. I rejoice in God's grace and forgiveness constantly. The reality of this room, there are often at least two choices of which door we might go through. And, you know, if you've not been in this office, you probably don't know that one door goes to a closet and the other door goes out into the rest of the house. And if we're displaying our childishness, displaying our foolishness, we're going into the closet thinking we're going to find what we need. We need to be seeking God's wisdom and going out into the world, going out into the rest of of the house out into what God has before us. What do we seek? What are we thinking about? Are we more, more concerned about whether or not someone might call us a child even if we are well along in years? Are we more determined to follow our God, to seek his wisdom and allow him to lift us up and to display his glory? Which way are we going to choose to go? Our primary passage today is coming to us from Luke. You may recall we read last week about the road to Emmaus. That's in Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. We're, we read through part of this. We're going to start in chapter 24 of Luke at verse 32 and go down through verse 47. Pray that we'll be listening for God's wisdom, that we'll be seeking to hear his word, and that we'll trust that scripture still speaks to us, the children of God. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the elect and their companions gathered it together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And he, when he said this to them, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. 
Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Lord, may we hear your words. May we trust that they are true. May we continually come to your throne seeking to be filled up to overflowing so that we may go out and spread the word of your love to all people. To God be the glory. Amen and amen. We've been going through what all the resurrection resurrected. What things have been brought back to life? What things have been brought to a newness, to a completeness, to be given all that is lacking and more? Again, we have a God of abundance. We have a God of more than enough. As we're listening to this sermon, we may be thinking about, as soon as I say a God of more than enough, and you may be thinking of everything that is lacking in your life. Of course, I, as I have spoken, I hope I have communicated that when we think we are lacking something, we're more than likely not seeing what God is doing. There's all sorts of things that disappoint us, all sorts of things that break our hearts, that draw us away from God. But when we don't have something, that's not something that should lead us away. We should immediately think, this is where God is going to do something amazing and wonderful through me and for me and around me. We need to recognize it's probably not going to be the way we might paint that picture. You know, just because we may want A, B, C, and D doesn't mean that God's immediately going to hand us those things. In God's plan for resurrecting our journey, we may have to come to the realization that if we get A first, it will pretty much eliminate getting B, C, and D. It may be we have to come around and get D and then B and then back to C and finally A. I hope my alph alphabet description hasn't confused you, but it's the reality of our journey and allowing God to resurrect that journey. I always get exhausted when I read the Emmaus Road thing. I've always been one who has to walk a lot, and I often get tired from it. So I feel that exhaustion when they go through that they went that seven-mile journey. They hadn't even eaten yet. And they were so excited, they got up and went right back the seven miles in the dark. But, you know, that's what God does. He resurrects that journey. His wisdom, his grace, the powerful work he did on the cross is ready to turn any of our toil, any of our labors into celebration. Think again about those words describing Christ's time on the cross. The joy set before him allowed him to endure that. Are we keeping God's joy set before us? The joy of our life that God loves and cares for us? That he has plans to prosper us and not to harm us? Plans to give us a hope-filled future? Just because God has plans doesn't mean we know what the plan is. That's never how God's plan works out that we get to know. The whole reality is to trust for things hoped for and not seen. Again, we have to have faith in God. If we put faith in these, our hands, in our bodies, well, I hope by now we've all figured out how weak and frail and easily brought down we are. You know, we can look outside and see that it's cloudy and it's ruined our day. We can go outside and see that our tomato plants got frostbitten. We're just done for after that. 
Oh, woe is me. I've got to start over. How many times have we already started over and, well, we're still here? How many times has God already brought us through? That's what I love about Scripture. It continually tells how God takes what seems like the end and it's just a new beginning. It's how God resurrects the journey. He can show us if we're willing to look back with his perspective that though we might have thought we chose the door that was going to the closet, God actually had something bigger to show us. And we might have went out this open door and then discovered that there was another door beyond that closed that led us to another door that was closed, that led us to where God intended for us to be. We have to recognize our weakness, our brokenness, that we see in a mirror dimly. Again, in our modern world where we have mirrors that shine so brightly, where I can talk to you through the phone on my camera that broadcasts via Bluetooth and the internet to get to YouTube, to then to Facebook or by text or email or however you're getting this message. I can't understand it. I don't know have a clue. I know some smart people invented it and they figured out how to use it and hallelujah. And they still don't have it all figured out. They're constantly learning and discovering. That's that reality. If we have sought God's joy, if we are reading his word, if we're allowing that to empower us, if we're seeking that resurrection power for who we are and trusting, if we're singing and rejoicing and being thankful, oh, the power we can have. You may be in the stage of your life where you're young and everyone is telling you you are young and that you're foolish and that you don't have anything figured out and that's okay. God will use that. I know I went through a lot of times of being foolish and still being foolish, and God uses that. You may be around my age in the middle part of life, and you thought you'd have it figured out by now, and you still don't. Or you thought you would achieve those goals, and you haven't. Or maybe you've achieved the goals you thought you wanted to have, and you still feel as lost as when you were a wee kid. I hope you've gotten to where you thought you needed to be and you're excited to be there and you're excited about going forward. You may have gone through all sorts of excitement and you're in, at best, the last third of life, maybe even farther along. My mother says since she's past 79, which is the average age that people pass on in the United States if you're a female, that she's on borrowed time. She's living out the years that other people didn't get to live. She's trying to rejoice in it, even as her body is continuing to tighten up and have restrictions and her vision fails and whatever else. How are we viewing our days? Are we trusting that God is still working even in us? Remember, Abraham and Sarah, the matriarch and patriarch of the nation of Israel, were around 100 when they had that baby by God's plan. And they raised that baby up to become Isaac, who had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob became Israel and had 12 kids. And then they went into captivity. Yeah. Just because we think one thing doesn't mean that's God's plan. We may have had barrenness and brokenness and failure upon failure, and there may be more failure out there, but that doesn't mean God isn't working his plan. We have to allow him to resurrect our journey. We have to allow him to guide us to the right door for whatever time we are in. We may be wanting to go out and God needs us to step into a quiet place. Or we may be ready to be in a quiet place and God is sending us out. We may feel the creaking of our bones or our chairs or who knows what, but God is still with us and his resurrection power is alive and well. He is here that we can touch him and feel him in the light of the sun, in the life of things blooming in the spring, in reading his word. 
in seeing again how he uses brokenness and failure as stepping stones to love, hope, joy, and peace. Brothers and sisters, I pray we'll continue to desire to be faithful, that we'll continue to allow God to resurrect our journey, to resurrect scripture, to resurrect our lives, to resurrect everything for his glory and honor that we will give him thanks and praise. Let us lean not on our own understanding, but trust that God is still at work, that his love for each of us is so much more than we might ever comprehend, and that he will complete the work that he has begun within each of us if we will trust him, if we'll trust that resurrection power and believe that there are better things coming. Let us be ready, let us rejoice, and give thanks and praise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his love abound around you and through you and for you. And may you follow him with joy this day and forevermore. To God be the glory. Amen and amen. Blessings. I hope that you can worship with us in person at Big Spring or at Clover Hill. Blessings be well.